Hi everyone, my name is Joshua Miles, and I'm guessing if you're watching this, then you are a massive true crime enthusiast just like me. For those of you who are in the US, who are avid true crime fans, you'll probably have heard about CrimeCon. Now, CrimeCon is the world's number one true crime event, and I am delighted to let you know that CrimeCon has made the jump across the pond and has arrived in the UK. I'm so happy to tell you that in June of 2021 in London, there will be the first ever CrimeCon UK, and I do hope that I will get to see all of your lovely faces there. In July 1997, a triple murder terrified residents in the nation's capital. Investigators could find no immediate suspects and no clear motive for the Metro DC police turned to the FBI for help. They hoped the Bureau's technical expertise could bring justice for the victims of the triple homicide. At a Georgetown coffee shop in Washington, D.C., three employees were shot to death. Evidence at the crime scene pointed in many different directions. Was this a hate crime, a robbery gone wrong, or an act of cold-blooded vengeance against one of the victims? I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. What seemed at first to be a senseless act of violence soon grew into a crime of federal proportions. In 1997, Washington, D.C. and its monuments played host to thousands over the three-day Fourth of July weekend. Visitors attended Independence Day celebrations throughout the capital. By Monday morning, July 7th, the holiday was officially over. Inhabitants of the Georgetown section of D.C. were just waking up to face the work week. At 5.15 a.m., the day shift supervisor at a popular coffee shop arrived to prepare for the onslaught of rush hour. She was surprised to see the night manager's car in the parking lot. The shop should have been closed at 8 p.m. the previous night. She found the lights still on, the music playing, and fresh pastries behind the counter. Yet no one seemed to be there, and the shop hadn't been thoroughly cleaned. She checked the shift schedule to see who was working the night before. Katie? Katie? She headed toward the back room, searching for her colleagues or some sort of explanation. Katie? There. She found the slaughtered bodies of the night crew. Oh my god! Oh my god! Ah! 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 She fled the shop and flagged down the first vehicle she saw, a city bus. The driver called the police. By dawn, the D.C. Metropolitan Police had sealed the shop and began to process the scene. A shoe print found by the front door did not match the soles of any of the victims, nor the day managers. Three employees were killed by multiple gunshots. Night manager Katie Mahoney, age 24. 18-year-old Aaron David Goodrich, and Emery Allen Evans, age 25. 
The victims had apparently been caught in the middle of their cleanup routine sometime after closing at 8 p.m. Katie Mahoney, who sustained most of the gunfire, was apparently still holding her keys when she fell. To Metropolitan Police Detective James Trainham, the wanton violence seemed like an act of personal vengeance. When I first learned of how the bodies were positioned and the number of shots that had been inflicted on Katie, uh, one, of the, one of the initial theories was, was it was a domestic, that she had had a fight with a boyfriend and ex-boyfriend. The other two were in the back room, giving them some privacy. She had gone to the back, followed by the boyfriend, and, there, and he exploded, shot her multiple times, and then shot them as they tried to come to her assistance. Six spent casings and four slugs from a 380 semi-automatic were collected from the floor. In the ceiling over the safe, they discovered one of three slugs from a 38 revolver. Multiple shots from two different guns suggested at least two gunmen. Detective Trainham now theorized that it might have been a robbery gone horribly wrong. When we found out that there were two guns and that there was a shot to the ceiling above the safe, which is typically a warning type shot, then that's when we started looking at commercial robbery. Now, was it totally conclusive that that made it a robbery? No, absolutely not. If it was a robbery attempt, the gunmen had likely panicked since they left empty handed. The cash drawers were untouched and there were no signs the safe had been tampered with. A receipt showed that one of the employees purchased a pound of coffee at 8.40, which meant they were likely still alive 40 minutes after the shop had closed. Detectives spoke to one witness who stopped by the shop at about 9.15 the previous evening. He saw the two male employees inside cleaning, but the door was locked, so he left, assuming it was closed. Several other would-be customers told detectives that they had visited the store moments later at around 9.30. Then at 9.30, we had actually two groups of people independently walk up to the front door. The door was unlocked. They walked right on in. They looked around. They could see that the store was in the process of being cleaned up, but there was nobody there. So they figured that people were in the back, and they left at that time. So we figured based on that sort of information that the murders occurred between 9.15 and 9.30. But the day shift manager told the detective that when she arrived in the morning, the front door was locked. The back door had been locked as well. There was no way to lock them without a key. If it was an inside job, she had a good idea of who it might be. One of the first things she told us about was an ex-employee who had been fired just a few weeks before that. He uh, had a drug habit, he had, and he was a shift manager, so he had access to the safe, to the alarms. The night after the theft, Katie noticed a discrepancy in the cash drawers on her shift. She tracked the loss to a single employee and fired him. Fine. Stupid. The company did not press charges against the man, and he agreed to pay back what he took over time. Police interviewed the ex-employee at his Georgetown home. He explained that he and Katie had worked out a payback agreement for the money he owed. He claimed to harbor no bad feelings towards her. Investigators photographed the soles of his shoes to compare against the print recovered at the crime scene. They provided no match. He said he was out of town at the time of the murders. His alibi checked out. The viciousness of the slayings became clearer at the autopsy. Katie Mahoney had been shot five times. Emory Allen Evans had been shot three times. Aaron David Goodrich had been shot once. 
the bullet piercing both lungs and his heart. Slugs removed from the victims confirmed that two weapons had been used. The unsolved murders riveted the public's attention. We are deeply saddened by the loss of three partners. The owners of the coffee shop chain offered a $50,000 reward for information leading to the killers. Calls poured in. Some believed it was a hate crime against the minority victims. Others claimed it may have something to do with Katie's former internship at the White House. What seemed more likely was that one of the victims may have been an accomplice who was double-crossed after giving access to the killers. The fact that no money was taken did uh, increase the number of possible theories as to why and actually what happened inside the store. Uh, but I think that once we did look into the background of the employees, once we found out what type of people they were, that began to, to eliminate a lot of the theories. To help focus the investigation, the detective called on his friend from the FBI Washington field office, Special Agent Brad Garrett. Over the years, Detective Trainham had come to rely on Agent Garrett's expertise. I've had a lot of experience in analyzing crime scenes, doing victimology, studying offender characteristics. And so it's, it's sort of like another set of eyes looking at, uh, at a scene. You know, there's nothing magical about it, but um, I think Jim respects my opinion and asked me initially to come take a look. The next day, investigators returned to the coffee shop to search for more clues. They noted the store had no security cameras and its alarm had not been breached the night of the crime. The front lock functioned properly and showed no signs of tampering. Perhaps the killers had entered with a key since the door was locked after the murders. The investigators tried to piece together events with what little they knew. They figured that the crew was still cleaning the store just after 9.15. That's when the killers must have burst in. Immediately, the gunmen probably hustled the crew into the back room closer to the safe. This is where they had apparently lost control of the situation. The bullet hole in the ceiling looked like a warning shot designed to get attention. The shot to the ceiling deafening the enclosed space probably only increased everyone's panic, resulting in this triple tragedy. Couple rounds down Investigators here. concluded that robbery, not murder, was likely the gunman's initial intention. They also believed the perpetrators had robbed before and would do so again. It's fairly rare in robbery situations where they kill either the patrons or the employees of the uh, store. So I wasn't really looking at groups that had killed other people. I was looking at groups that came in, guns drawn, were ready to commit violence if they needed to commit violence. So, and again, that's not uncommon for people in, a, in robberies, obviously, to pull guns out. But typically people that will rob a commercial facility like this coffee store uh, will typically then target similar type of situations. But the scenario presented few clues to the killer's identities. Investigators hoped an overlooked answer remained in the shop. Behind the counter, the detective found Katie Mahoney's to-do list. She had almost completed it the night she was killed. One item she hadn't checked off yet was to apologize to an employee. Detectives learned that Katie had reprimanded the employee for his less than professional appearance a few days before she was killed. The man said that he bore no grudge against Katie. 
My buddy's deep. That's all we were doing. And, and what's your buddy's He explained that she was sensitive and might have felt concerned that she'd been too harsh with him, but he didn't feel that way. Okay, all right. Investigators confirmed he was with friends when the murders took place. It was another dead end. Detective Trainham poured over store procedures and policies and discovered that someone else had been to the store at 2 a.m. We found out that the pastry guy comes with his you know, delivery. When he arrived there that morning, he just assumed that the door was locked, used his key, pushed the carts in, closed it, and locked it behind. And that's how come when the shift manager got there, all the doors were locked. The pastry delivery explained why the front door had been locked, but it did not reveal how the killers gained entry. Three days after the triple homicide, investigators still had no leads to the killers' identities. The murderers were still on the loose. On July 7, 1997, three employees had been shot to death in a Georgetown coffee shop. A reward offered by corporate headquarters and local businesses for information grew to $100,000, the largest for a crime in D.C. history. The heavy publicized reward induced dozens of false claims. For Special Agent Brad Garrett, chasing rumors as part of the job. One thing you have to do in any of these cases is you have to keep a lot of balls in the air at the same time. You can't just do one thing. So while we're looking at the backgrounds of the victim, disgruntled employees, employees that have been fired, we're also looking at robbery groups. We're also talking to robbery homicide detectives in the metropolitan area about what cases they've had. Is there anybody that sort of fits this genre of, of um, what happened? How you doing, bud? Despite their efforts, they found no leads after two and a half months. Then on September 27, 1997, Metropolitan Homicide detectives received an anonymous call. The caller claimed that two people were involved in the shooting. One was named Carl. He didn't know Carl's last name, but described him as thin, mid-twenties, with brown skin according to Detective James Trainum, He said Carl lived on Gallatin Street, described the location where he lived, and he said he lived there with his mother, his wife, and his child, and that they drove a car that was a different color blue. He said, if anybody is telling you anything else, they're wrong. Name, no. The man promised to call back when he learned more. Detective Trainum. Just got some good information. Investigators good. checked DMV records and assembled a list of all the cars on Gallatin Street in Washington, D.C. Right. On the 1200 the block, they found one registered to a man named Carl yeah, Cooper. Yeah. The car was listed as blue. A criminal background check revealed that 28-year-old Carl Cooper had a record of commercial armed robbery and suspected murder. Got you, Go ahead. Carl Cooper and an associate robbed two convenience stores at gunpoint in Prince George's County, Maryland in January 1989. When Cooper's associate was later found shot to death, Cooper was the prime suspect, but police never found enough evidence to prove he killed his partner. His criminal record, coupled with the anonymous caller's statement, made Carl Cooper the prime suspect in the coffee shop triple homicide. Investigators needed to find out more about Cooper. Special Agent Brad Garrett secured a warrant to establish a trap and trace on Cooper's home phone. A pen register and trap and trace would give you incoming and outgoing telephone numbers only. You cannot hear what goes on the line, but it records every time you dial a number out, we get, it shows up on a screen. And every time someone calls into you, it shows up. And it shows up, the, it shows the duration of the call. So what that did, obviously, it gave us who Mr. Cooper was talking to. What individuals out there in the community is he interacting with? Agents discovered that one man who worked as a local barber called Cooper's home frequently. Informants claimed the barber was likely Cooper's accomplice in the coffee shop killings. 
to gather more information on Cooper and those who visited him. Undercover agents dressed as telephone repairmen and set up surveillance on Carl Cooper's house. We'd put up a very discreet pole camera outside his house where it would shoot 24 hours a day on his front door to see, obviously, who's coming and going, what hours does he keep, what is his routine, what cars does he get into, who comes to visit him. Agents didn't need a court order since it was public surveillance. They monitored Cooper around the clock and created a videotape record of everyone entering and leaving the house. Right on the house, right? Yeah, look. Okay, great. I can zoom up if we need to. Pretty much go anywhere we want. They identified his child and his wife. The surveillance was not limited to his home. Teams were also assigned to tail Cooper throughout the city. Carl Cooper visited the barber shop where his alleged accomplice worked. Investigators needed to somehow confirm if the barber had been involved in the coffee shop killings. They hoped a trap and trace on his phone would tell them more. At this point, we're just trying to figure out who this guy is in the barber shop, and what is his relationship with Carl, and had he committed robberies with Carl. So we did a background on him. He had served time for armed robbery. And based on what sources were telling us, that the two of them, along with other individuals, had committed armed robberies. Agents discovered a stronger connection through the trap and trace on the barber's farm. They recognized the name of a woman who called the barber frequently. She was the former girlfriend of the robbery partner allegedly killed by Cooper several years earlier. She said that Cooper, the barber, and her boyfriend at the time were all friends before her boyfriend was killed. Now she only kept in touch with the barber since she believed Cooper was responsible for her boyfriend's death. She also knew Cooper's wife and explained how she helped him with his crimes. Carl Cooper's wife purchased weapons illegally for him. One was a 9mm handgun. His wife used a driver's license with her maiden name and an old address so the 9mm couldn't be traced back to her husband, Carl. Carl's accomplices used their girlfriends in the same way. The girlfriend was extremely cooperative. She was still interested in bringing closure to his case. And she gave us even more background on Carl Cooper and his associates. She told us about a third person who, who was working with them during the, the summer of 1997 committing robberies. Investigators placed Carl Cooper's alleged third man under surveillance. He was a small-time crack dealer. If he, in fact, knew anything about the murders, his blatant criminal activity made him a liability to Cooper. Authorities planned to arrest the dealer after a series of undercover drug buys and force him to come clean about the murder suspect. But it would take weeks, perhaps months, to establish trust and purchase enough crack to charge him with felony drug trafficking. If they arrested him before that, the charges would not be stiff enough to leverage his cooperation. Until then, investigators had no evidence to arrest Carl Cooper for the coffee shop triple homicide. And as time passed, Cooper would be more difficult to get to since he had insulated himself with so many. By the end of July 1998, over a year had passed since three employees at a Georgetown coffee shop had been shot to death. The FBI and DC Metro Police believed that 29-year-old Carl Cooper and at least one accomplice were responsible. But investigators still had no direct proof. 
To find it, they pursued Cooper from all directions, tracing his calls, watching his house, and surveilling his associates. Despite their relentlessness, Cooper remained just out of reach. But investigators did learn that Cooper knew he was a suspect, according to FBI Special Agent Brad Garrett. As you move into these cases further and further and you talk to more and more people, particularly people on the street, the word's going to get back to whoever you're looking at if they're out on the street. And it did. I mean, he knew in fairly short order that the police and the FBI were taking a look at him. The FBI and Metro DC police were not the only agencies investigating Cooper. In nearby Prince George's County, Maryland, Sergeant Joseph McCann was investigating yes, Cooper for the attempted murder of a police officer. Jim, Joe McCann, how are you? The sergeant was working with a female informant who also wanted to tell the FBI what she knew about Cooper. The informant and Mr. Cooper had uh, committed several armed robberies together, which is the reason why the informant was in jail for armed robbery at the time. So uh, she knew him very well. Place. I was the getaway driver. There's two others involved. Investigators interviewed her at a prison in Pennsylvania. Though she had no direct knowledge of the coffee shop murders, she knew firsthand how Cooper operated. The woman told about a pizzeria robbery that they'd committed in September 1996. Cooper was the leader. She was the driver of the stolen getaway car. Cooper's friend, the barber, and the woman's boyfriend at the time were also in on the job. She said that Cooper carried two guns into the restaurant that night, as he usually did. Why, everybody, don't move! Don't move! Get out. Get out. Get out His job was to shoot anyone who didn't obey orders. No gunfire was needed that night. They collected the cash drawer and wallets and made a fast getaway. Tell me just as best you can recall what Cooper told you. The informant wasn't finished. She told investigators about another robbery shortly after the pizzeria heist, when Cooper had fired his weapon. That evening, Cooper carried a 9mm and a stolen 38 revolver. The barber drove the getaway car. Their plan was to rob couples parked in Avondale Park in Hyattsville, Maryland. Give me your money. Cooper was unaware that the man he attacked was an off-duty Maryland officer. Cooper fired twice, hitting him once. Eric, I believe his name is. The informant said that Cooper had told her about it the next day, when the news revealed that the man he shot was an off-duty police officer. How long had you been? Fortunately, the officer survived the attack. A check of police reports confirmed everything the informant had said. Special Agent Brad Garrett had every reason to believe her. Her level of detail was just phenomenal. You know, she was able to, to lay out when it happened, where it happened, what time it happened, who participated, even the interaction between the robbers and the victims that we knew about, obviously, through what the victims had told us during the robbery. So she was really a pot of gold in this case. The information demonstrated that Cooper wasn't just a violent criminal. He was the leader of a band of robbers. The informant had provided facts that the FBI could build a case around. She was basically the first bit of information that in, in my mind and in the prosecutor's mind that really started fitting a RICO case or a racketeering case where you've got a group that's committing violent acts, interstate, robbing commercial facilities, and that we saw through her the real possibility of putting together a federal RICO indictment that would include 
the coffee store triple murder. Building a racketeering case that proved Carl Cooper was the leader of a criminal organization meant outlining those activities in detail. The FBI secured a warrant to wiretap Cooper's phone. Now they could capture conversations, not just phone numbers. Any incoming conversations as, well. as part of the warrant, they also cloned Cooper's pager number. Anytime someone paged Cooper, the agent's pager would also beep. With everything in place, Detective Trainham hoped to stimulate conversation between Cooper and his associates. They began by inquiring on the whereabouts of the 9mm handgun purchased illegally by Cooper's wife. Well, we knew that his wife had made that purchase of a handgun for him in 1996. So what we did was we went out to the address that she had given the gun shop when she had purchased the gun, and it turned out to be her mother's address. As a ruse to get information, investigators asked the mother if her daughter still had the 9mm handgun. They told her they needed to complete a routine check of its serial number to verify whether it had been used in a crime. Well, she hasn't called me. I have not disowned, I just have not heard. The woman claimed that she had not spoken to her daughter since they had had a disagreement some time ago. Thank you. Investigators felt sure that she was lying. As we were walking back to the car, a distance of less than 50 feet, Carl's pager starts going off with 911, 911 behind it. And uh, we knew that uh, we had probably struck some kind of nerve there at that point. Already, That's it. She doesn't know where That's she is. The number. I don't believe it. Agents monitoring Cooper's home phone heard the mother call to warn that authorities were looking for her daughter's gun. Okay. All right. Cooper's wife tried paging Carl, but he didn't respond. Next, she called her father, panicking because she couldn't find the weapon and feared that she'd be implicated in her husband's crime. If anybody's been Carl's wife was on a cordless phone, sitting outside on the front porch, and she's on the phone to one of her relatives, hysterically sobbing about how the police are going to lock her up for this gun, that Carl's done something with this gun and that she looked in the hiding place in the house and the gun wasn't there, so Carl must have it. And she was just going on and on and on. So then she calls Carl, and he's on his way home. He's on a cell phone on his way home. And she says, Carl, I'm going to call this police officer right now. And he's screaming at her, no, no, don't, don't call. I mean, just screaming at her on the phone. After Cooper's wife hung up, Investigators went to her residence to speak with her directly. I've said they, were here. they knew she and Carl were home, but no one came to the door. After almost 14 months of pursuit, investigators were confident they were closing in on the suspected murderer. But Cooper was not the sort of man to sit idly by and allow himself to be cornered. In September 1998, Metropolitan Washington, D.C. police and the FBI continued to pursue Carl Cooper, the alleged ringleader of an armed gang wanted in the triple homicide of three Georgetown coffee shop employees. Surveillance of Cooper's house, phone, family, and friends began to pay off for investigators. Detective James Trainham overheard an incriminating conversation between Cooper's wife and the girlfriend of one of Cooper's alleged accomplices. So she's trying to figure out why the police are looking at Carl. And she starts what we call this guessing game. And she goes, was it for the shooting in the park? Missy goes, no. Was it for the robbery of the pizza place? She goes, no. And then, she said, well, what is it? And Missy goes, something along the lines of, you know, that thing I told you about, that thing in Georgetown. And the other woman brings up, you mean the coffee shop? And she goes, yeah, yeah. At that point, we knew that his wife and this other woman 
had intimate knowledge of all these other crimes that Carl had committed. This is $200. Using her maiden name and mother's address, investigators were already aware that Cooper's wife had purchased a 9 millimeter illegally for her husband. Now they would turn up the pressure on Carl's wife to reveal the whereabouts of the handgun. Investigators showed up at Cooper's wife's workplace, unannounced, to again ask her where the 9mm was. According to Detective James Trainham, they caught her completely off guard, which was their intention. We're here to talk to you about the gun. And when she saw us, it was like she hit a brick wall. I mean, just her face dropped, she, became, she began to shake. She became very nervous, and we're, you know, just very, very calm. Mrs. Cooper, we don't know why you're so um, upset. This is just a routine nervous. investigation. Are you okay at home? Cooper's wife told okay them that she still had the 9mm handgun, but it was in storage in Maryland. I don't know. Good. She agreed to turn it over to them later that evening at her grandfather's home. Close to the appointed time, FBI agents watched suspected murderer Carl Cooper removing what appeared to be a gun case from his house. Agents were not sure what to expect at the meeting with his family. Garrett. Maybe it was a trap. He just left in the car. He had the gun on. The agent wore a wire to alert other agents parked close by if they should need assistance. Why get my house? As they approached Cooper's no wife's grandfather's Maryland home, Cooper confronted them. He accused the agents of harassing his wife, but he didn't prevent them from going inside. Her grandfather and child sat at the table with the gun. Since the 9mm handgun was already in plain view, investigators were legally permitted to seize it. That type of weapon was not used in the coffee shop killings, but it was the same type used to shoot an off-duty officer in a Maryland park. Agents sent the gun to the ballistics lab where it was test fired and compared to the slugs removed from the wounded officer. Shallow grooves imprinted by the inside of the barrel on each of the slugs did not match. But the marks made by the weapon's ejector pin on the shell casings matched those on the shell casings collected from the crime scene. Experts determined that the barrel might have been switched or altered, but they agreed that this was definitely the gun used to shoot the officer in Maryland, according to Sergeant Joseph McCann. Once we received that ballistic report and we confirmed that this weapon that was registered to Carl Cooper's wife was used to shoot an off-duty Prince George's County police officer, at that point we had entered into a, a completely different realm in the investigation. Uh, it stepped it up considerably at that point. Though investigators had evidence against Cooper for that crime, they had little to charge him for the Georgetown triple homicide or for federal racketeering. To get to Cooper, Special Agent Brad Garrett and his team turned back to one of Cooper's alleged accomplices, a crack dealer who had been under surveillance for months. We set up multiple crack buys from this guy until eventually we got up to a quantity that he faced a mandatory minimum sentence in federal court, and then we arrested him. The key is was to get him to help us. Investigators would pressure him to inform on Cooper in exchange for a reduction in his trafficking charges. One, two, three. To avoid years in prison, the dealer agreed to wear a wire. He wasn't as close to Cooper as agents had hoped. But the dealer was close to another one of Cooper's alleged accomplices. Hey, his what's friend up? from the barber shop. Good, good. He called the barber to set I was up a meeting. If I can meet with you guys. The entire conversation would be caught on tape. 
The informant told the barber that police had stopped him on the street, asking questions about their involvement with Carl Cooper in the triple homicide. The barber was already aware of the investigation and assured him that he had nothing to do with it. The barbershop guy kind of whispers to the drug dealer, look, I know Carl did it. He called me the night before, and he wanted me to go along with him. But he never called me back. I said I would, but he never called me back. And then the next morning, bam, they were dead. Other than the anonymous caller that put them on the trail shortly after the crime, this was the FBI's first real connection between Cooper, his gang, and the coffee shop homicides. Now it was the barber's turn to be taken in. Agents hoped he would be the key to taking a triple murderer off the streets. A year and a half after a botched robbery and triple homicide in a Georgetown coffee shop, the FBI and Washington Metro Police were closing in on a gang of suspected thieves and murderers. A barber, believed to be one of them, told an FBI informant that he had agreed to rob the coffee shop with ringleader Carl Cooper. But Cooper never called him back, so the barber figured Cooper had committed the crime by himself. FBI Special Agent Brad Garrett decided it was time to question the barber directly and find out how much he knew about Cooper. So we thought at that point, well, the barber chef guy obviously knows something about this, but he's basically saying he would have participated but wasn't called, so didn't participate. So we weren't, we weren't sure at that point. Now, then did Cooper do it alone? Did he pull somebody else in to help him do the robbery? We weren't really sure, but we then had enough that we could charge the barbershop guy. Early in the morning, authorities followed the barber from his home and cornered him in an isolated location. Agents wanted to be certain that no one, especially Carl Cooper, knew that Cooper's suspected accomplice was being taken in. Barber was arrested without incident and transported to the FBI office for questioning. The man once again denied any participation in the coffee shop homicides. But he did tell agents what Carl Cooper had said the night before the crime. He told us that Carl had come to him and said, you know, I've been surveilling this, this, this coffee shop. It doesn't have any surveillance cameras. They take in a lot of money, and I want to, I want to hit it. And he said, "Okay, I'll go with you." What do you want the me to do? The barber maintained that Cooper never called him back. Start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And as far as he knew, the ringleader had no other accomplices on the job. Even if the barber hadn't participated in the coffee shop murders, authorities had enough to charge him with conspiracy to commit armed robbery, hoping for leniency. He told them what he knew about Cooper. He told me to get a car, I got the car. On May 1st, 1993, he and Cooper committed their first crime together. The barber didn't have a gun, but Cooper said he would get one for him. They spotted an armed security guard at a DC apartment building. Cooper snuck up on him. Hey. When the guard tried to draw his weapon, Cooper shot him, then took the dead man's gun. Look, man, got him. Carl runs out, runs to him, and they take off. So that's a murder we didn't even know about that Cooper had done. So that also was another case that, that was rolled into this uh, Rico indictment. We ran into the pizza store, and it was The barber understood that stopping Cooper was the FBI's ultimate goal. He agreed to wear a wire and meet with Cooper. Agents followed the barber through less populated roads after he picked up Cooper in his car. In the course of their recorded conversation, Cooper expressed his rage that the authorities were on his back. Did you hear that, Nick? Yeah. Sounds like he wants to kill a DC cop. He vowed to kill Agent Garrett and Detective Trainham. He also admitted that at one point he had seen Brad Garrett on the street and he had followed him for a while and he was laughing about how Brad didn't know that he was being followed. And so uh, 
It was a bit unnerving. But we knew that we had to arrest Carl pretty quickly after that. Authorities weren't going to take any chances. A few days later, they decided to arrest him for shooting the officer in Maryland. They hoped a search warrant for his house would provide the physical evidence needed to tie him directly to the coffee shop slayings. Inside Cooper's home, officers found ski masks, law enforcement clothing, and a variety of ammunition. But none of it could prove that Carl Cooper had murdered the three employees at the coffee shop. The FBI's last hope was to sweat it out of him. Cooper knew that all they had was evidence of conspiracy and hearsay from secondary sources. Despite two hours of grilling, Cooper remained steadfast in his denial. Time had run out on the investigation. We did not have a good case on him for the coffee shop murders. But if we charged him with the racketeering in D.C., then we would be under a time constraint to get him indicted and convicted. And we just didn't want to place ourselves under that constraint. So we decided that PG County had the strongest case, that they were the ones that were going to be able to hold him without letting him get out of jail, thus placing all of our other people in jeopardy. After his interview in D.C., officers from Prince George's County, Maryland, came to transport him to their jurisdiction. There he would face charges of shooting the off-duty police officer. But Cooper was preoccupied by the FBI's investigation. He demanded to take a lie detector test to prove his innocence. Cooper took one in Maryland, but failed miserably. That's when he finally broke. I think that Carl felt that we had him in a box for the coffee shop murders and that he was going to be charged with those, and that he was going to go down for those. So he wanted to put his spin on it to, make, to put him in the best light possible. Of course, with him being the only person, who could he blame it on but the victims? And that's what he tried to do. Cooper actually made three separate confessions, each time taking more of the blame. In his final confession, he claimed total responsibility for the coffee shop killings. He said he planned and carried out the robbery after spending time casing the shop. He called his accomplice, the barber, but then decided he could handle it on his own. He didn't want to lose the window of opportunity after the shop closed and before the crew went home. He admitted to Sergeant Joseph McCann that he brought two weapons to the scene, which was his signature. Carl Cooper's uh, approach when he committed robberies was very businesslike. It was a business to him. It was not personal. And if you did exactly as he said, usually you would make it out of there. But on that night, three of Cooper's victims did not. At about 9.20, Katie Mahoney, Emery Evans, and Aaron Goodrich were towards the end of their cleanup routine. For some reason, no one will ever know why. When Cooper arrived at the shop, the door was unlocked. He ordered everyone into the back office where the safe was kept. According to Cooper, the female manager tried to escape when he fired his warning shot into the ceiling. Cooper began to lose control of the situation and of his temper. He shot her first, then the others. Cooper shot Katie four more times and left with nothing. I think People were, were very surprised that one individual had committed this act. That it just, it, I think it's beyond most people's comprehension that, that one person could go in where there's three employees and try to commit a robbery. 
yeah, 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 yeah. He said he rushed back home, laundered his clothes, and disposed of the weapons. They were never recovered. In February 2000, more than two years after the triple homicide, Carl Cooper confessed to and was convicted of 48 charges stemming from that crime, as well as the murder of a security guard, the shooting of the off-duty police officer, the robbery of the pizzeria, and leading a racketeering enterprise. By pleading guilty, Cooper avoided the death penalty. He was serving a life sentence with no possibility of parole and no appeal.